Um, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna do a screen share. I created a PowerPoint for us tonight. And those of you who attended some of the formation hour will notice that it's basically the same uh, format and look of all of my PowerPoints because I just have the ability to do one. So, um, and that's not it. Hold on just a second. All right, let's see if this works. All right, can you see that? Give me a, someone give me a thumbs up if you can see me, say the color compromise. Sorry, th thumbs up. Okay, perfect, two thumbs up, thank you. All right, so here we go. Someone give me a wave or, a, or just unmute yourself and yell at me if it, if it gets messed up and you're not hearing it or tracking with it. So, all right, so really quickly, um, we are studying the color of compromise, written by Jamar Tisby. I know most of you have already uh, jumped into it and know a little bit, little, little bit about Jamar, but if you don't, um, Jamar is um, a friend of Pete and I's. We have uh, met him on a couple of occasions. We brought him in for the, for the second One Charleston Conference about four years ago. It was downtown at Burke, and he gave a brief talk on history and the church that was just really um, harrowing and wonderful, but really difficult to, to hear. Um, so we met him first then, and then I met him again on a crew leadership, like crew national leadership pilgrimage. Uh, that came through Charleston and um, wasn't Mother Emanuel, kind of reflected on Mother Emanuel and its significance in the city. And Jamar gave a talk on history and was kind of helping lead that pilgrimage. They were stopping at different significant civil rights sites um, throughout the U.S. And so I got to spend a little bit more time with him then. Um, and he is, um, uh, uh, he's been historically been involved in um, the church. He, he was a part of Teach for America in Mississippi, and it was a part of a PCA church there. Um, he's currently pursuing a PhD in history from uh, Ole Miss, from Mississippi University, I believe. And yeah, he's fantastic. So I'm excited to jump into this. Um, so just a quick overview of this course outline. Hold on, there we go. Um, so we are going to jump in tonight and just discuss chapter one. Um, if you read it, it's just a very simple introduction to what the book is and what it is not. Uh, the kinds of things that it'll cover um, should be a fairly, um, I think, good place to start, good conversation starters. Um, next week, we'll cover two chapters, uh, the colonial and revolutionary eras. The following week, we'll do four and five, antebellum civil war eras. Uh, week four, chapters six and seven, covers Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and a race in the North. Uh, week five, chapters eight and nine, we'll cover civil rights and then up into the late 20th century with the religious right. And then the final two chapters are on our current day and how the church has responded and it will respond to Black, Black Lives Matter and then some kind of takeaways. So that's the outline of the course. Uh, the format each week will look something like this. We'll have some sort of icebreaker question just to jump in. I'll give a brief, brief synopsis of what we've, or whoever's leading the discussion. I will be mostly me, but maybe other folks as well. Brief synopsis of what we've read. Um, and then we'll kind of go through a series of discussion topics, okay? So the idea is that we'll kind of present an idea and then we'll send you away for five to seven minutes um, to talk about it in small groups. And then you will come back from your small group with a couple of takeaways, just some high points. And so you, you're tasked in your group with the responsibility, the, the, the great weighty responsibility of nominating someone to be your spokesperson, okay? So you can do not it, you can, um, you can vote, it can be very democratic, however you wanna handle that, but I trust that you're adults and can figure it out. And then finally, we'll finish uh, with some application. And um, yeah, so we'll finish with application. We're always, you know, we're learning about our history, uh, we're talking about the ways that the church has failed in the past, but we're always going to be using that to um, look at 2020, um, the city of Charleston, the Cathedral Church of St. Luke and St. Paul, and ask the question, you know, how does this affect us? How has this affected us? And uh, what might the Lord be calling us to do in order to, uh, to move forward? So um, some outcomes that I have thought about, again, there, there are lots of different possibilities, obviously, through our discussions. But the first one is that I think um, comes come across really strong in the first chapter is just that we would, we would hear some truth. Um, I think a lot of us um, have heard probably different narratives and different emphases uh, from our look at history, our study of history, specifically with, with regard to the church. 
And my hope is that we are, have ears to hear um, some of the things that, that Jamar in, points out in his book and uh, that hope that brings us to a place of honesty um, with our past and with ourselves. Um, I hope that honesty leads us to a place of empathy. Again, empathy for our forebears, but also empathy for um, those who have been affected by this and who in, 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 in some ways continue to be affected by our past. And then finally, that the Lord would lead us to places of action, to prayerful action. So that's my hope. Um, very quickly, some posture. Um, I just want to remind you all that we are, I believe we're all on this call, believers in Jesus Christ. Um, in one of his final sermons in John, um, Jesus reminds his disciples that by this, all people will know that you are my disciples um, if you have love for one another. And so that is the unique mark of the people of God is the way that we love one another, despite disagreement, despite um, different backgrounds and different um, ethnicities and different uh, convictions that we are we're called to love one another. And then Paul, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians unpacks what love looks like in that very famous uh, wedding uh, passage. Uh, when he says, love is patient and kind, love does not envy. Or, I can't read that, sorry, because your faces are in the way. Give me just a second. <laughs> um, and now my mouse is missing. Okay, yeah, it does not envy or is not, what, it is not arrogant or rude, does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And so my charge for us, especially when we are in our groups, I guess my, my charge for all of us throughout the whole process is that we would have a posture of humility. We would seek to be humble and be teachable. Um, again, none of us are experts in this. And so, um, you know, we all have something to learn. And so that's our first posture. And then we would learn to be patient with one another. And then that we would be committed to being um, kind, um, even in the midst of frustration or disagreement. So um, any questions or thoughts or comments on any of that that we've covered on what this is going to look like? No, good. Okay, great. One, one more thing that I did not cover is that we are going to have homework. Um, in addition to the week, to the reading, um, I'm going to probably add some supplemental materials, just very simple, probably essays or videos um, for you to check out through the week. It's obviously optional. You don't have to participate. Um, and yeah, so those will, I'll send you as soon as this is over with, I will send in um, to either email or into our our planning center groups app. I'll send you a PDF that has the resources for this week. We'll go for, go through them at the end of the video, but then I'll send those. And then I'd love for um, really quickly, Anna Bruner, would you tell us a little bit about some of the homework um, that you have um, worked up for us? Yeah. So, um, you know, in thinking through this study, um, this isn't just a, we, we will be doing a lot of um, intellectual learning, but um, I think our prayer for it is that it wouldn't just be an intellectual exercise. And so um, I have help, had some assistance in compiling um, a weekly list of things that we can both engage our minds, hearts, and bodies in what we're learning. Um, and we'll be talking about those every week. Um, but the thing we're centering it around is the Collect for Social Justice. Um, which we can touch on or we can send it along with the resources. Um, but in that prayer, it talks about uh, examining the walls that divide us and so that suspicions would cease and ultimately hatreds would cease. And so um, we're going to be looking throughout the study on ways that, um, yeah, God would, we would ask God to show us ways that. Um, his spirit would move us to think differently and change. But I, yeah, I'll, I'll be sending those or talking about those every week with Patrick. Um, okay, so I think a good, a good synopsis of this book and of the chapter that Tisby lays out is that this book, it, he's trying to um, tell the truth. And I found this, this quote pretty compelling. He says, tell, the color of compromise is about telling the truth so that reconciliation, robust, consistent, honest reconciliation might occur across racial lines. And then throughout the rest of the chapter, he talks about the different um, 
facets of truth. And the first thing he talks about is telling the truth about racism. And we'll talk about this in just a second, but um, basically he wants to argue that racism is not simply something that we experience in, at the individual level, but like all sins, there's an individual and a corporate dimension to it. And that racism is something that um, is fairly expansive. And we'll, we'll read a quote of that in just a second. But um, so he wants to tell the truth. And he wants to tell the truth about um, about racism and particularly the, the systemic forms and the ways that the church has responded to that throughout history. Um, third, he wants to tell the truth about um, a complicit church. This will be one of our questions we'll discuss as well, but essentially the whole book is a historic, a very cursory historic overview of um, the way that the church has failed in, in, in most regards, not in all regards, we'll talk about that in a second, but in most regards, um, to racism, failed to stand up, failed to be a witness, uh, failed to speak out. Um, there were some examples of a speaking out. You know, most many of the abolitionists were Christians. Obviously, the the work of uh, the Clapham sect in England, the Wilberforce um, evangelicals who ended the slave trade there, um, are, are shining examples, amazing examples um, of 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 the churches um, bearing witness to. Um, to that sin and calling it out, speaking truth to power, all of that. Um, but there are many more failures, I think, especially in our past um, than there were successes. And so he wants to be honest about that, telling the truth about that. Um, fourth, um, he wants to seek to tell the truth in love. He makes very sh sure that we know that he loves the church and is not simply wanting to stand far away and cast stones at it, uh, but that he in fact, he in fact loves it dearly. Um, I spent some time this afternoon reading uh, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And, um, and he has a whole section in there where he talks about just that, that he can't escape the church. You know, he is, a, he is the grandson and the son of a preacher. And so all of the work that he was doing and challenging white Christians, white clergy in that letter uh, to stand up, to join him in his, in his pursuit of justice um, is because he in fact loves the church and believes that this is what uh, the work that Jesus has given him to do. So anyway, we'll probably talk about that in, in coming weeks. But he, want, he does love the church. He's speaking this truth because he loves the church, not because he wants to see it torn down. Um, and from, my, um, from knowing Jamar personally, he is, um, he's very committed to being a part of a church. And so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to start with this book from a deeply committed Christian. So um, next, uh, he wants to remind us that um, the truth is hard. I think we will see that there are parts and sections of this book that will be probably difficult to read for, for some, um, whether we're in disbelief or whether we just, um, you know, kind of don't want to believe that some of the primary sources he shows were, were accurate or, or, or depicted something that was widespread, you know, that they weren't isolated in, incidents, but that they were actually more widespread. Um, and so he talks about the, the notion of grief, that the, the, the point of this book is not to bring shame, um, but this is actually to bring grief and grief. And he quotes um, Paul in Second Corinthians that says that there's a kind of grief that actually leads to repentance. And so that's the kind of thing that we want, not just guilt, right? Not just shame, but, but actually true godly grief. Um, and then finally, whoops, finally, um, he wants to tell the truth uh, to, for it to be a catalyst of change. And I think that, that one of the reasons why I wanted to read this book, because I think it's a, it's, um, does a great job in a, in, a, in a short amount of time to discuss the history, but I think it leaves us, he makes some recommendations, but I think that many of us, when we're done with this study, um, will, will, you know, just ask, what can we do? How can we respond to this? How can we respond to this with, with empathy, with compassion, with prayerful action um, in our personal lives, in our church, in our city? And so that's essentially where he stops. You know, it's, it's, it's very basic, um, but telling the truth. So that's what we're going to explore. So, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna go ahead and jump back into breakouts unless anyone has any, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a second. Um, unless anyone has any, actually I'm not gonna stop screen sharing. Any, any comments or questions about any of that?